Good morning and welcome everyone to this wonderful segment, The Divine Feminine. And we're here to welcome Lisa Levinson, who's going to be our guest speaker today at the um, block party number... 22. Yay, good number. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, Lisa, um, we start every morning uh, of the Divine Feminine segment with a, a reading. Um, I love poetry and I do a lot of research. Um, so if that's okay with you, I'll just start um, with a quote from this person's book, you know, Animal Speak by Ted Andrews. And um, I thought this would be an appropriate introduction to your uh, talk this morning. Many ancient myths and stories speak of a magical time and place in which there were no boundaries between humans and animals. Animals and humans speak, spoke, excuse me, spoke. Wild and tame had no meaning and always the divine revealed itself in nature. Um, and I, I thought that would be really wonderful to start with because I think we're coming back into a time where um, we, we've been slowed down and our attention's been focused inward, but it's also been focused outward to nature. And I find that the people around me are starting to notice things they haven't noticed in a long time. And I'll just tell a very quick story as well about planting seeds, which I find really interesting. So I do talk with animals and they talk with me all the time. And I have a, a really lovely entourage of animals that follow me around the island and Jamin and I feed them. <laughs> at my, I'm an artist and at my studio, um, there are all kinds of fantastic birds, which I call my family, which I feed. And they all turn up and they're really mad at me if I turn up late and they are demonstrative about it. And um, I share my studio space with another woman who really didn't see those animals. And she uh, couldn't really understand what I was doing, why I was feeding them. And um, because of COVID now, we have alternating days. So I'm there every other day and she's there in between. And of course, when I'm not there, the food doesn't go out. So they've been getting to her. They've been nagging her. <laughs> and at first she ignored them. The crows are very demonstrative. You know, they'll drop rocks on the car <laughs> or poop on the car. <laughs> God bless them. And um, there are all these beautiful songbirds and they just gather. And there's this beautiful family of these songbirds like just hanging out outside the studio waiting. And she's finally noticed. And I, I thought this is such an interesting shift in a human being, you know, to, to start to understand um, that we can, we ha these are our family members and that there is a connection and that there, there can be a re interspecies relationship. And then it starts a healing process. And now she's, she'll call me and say, hey, Mel, uh, we're out of bird seed. Could you get some more? So she's entered into this story of interspecies <laughs> relationship. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share that. I thought because of the work you do, that would be kind of a fun story to, to um, introduce you with. So thank you so much for being here and I'll turn it over to Jackie who's going to guide us now through this conversation. Thank you, Melissa. And again, thank you so much everyone for joining us, not only on this 22nd, wonderful, amazing celebration of this family gathering at the 24 hour block party, but also for the Divine Feminine segment, um, a quantic re-education for humanity. And we really believe that we have to combine both sides of our brains. We have to combine our analytical, academic, intellectual side to co-create solutions, but we also have a moral obligation to raise our consciousness, to facilitate the healing that's, that's destined to happen with these gatherings and these communications and this interconnectedness. And I have the pleasure of, of knowing Lisa Levinson for a couple of years now and being on the Interfaith Vegan Coalition has really been part of my spiritual growth. Um, it was for me, I was on a spiritual journey when I discovered veganism and it was when those two came together for me that elevated my awareness and consciousness to where it is now. and. It has been a profound change and I have never seen the world the same way again. And I want to thank Lisa um, and 
and her friends that came together to bring the veganism and the spirituality in one conversation. So thank you, Lisa, for all you do. I will read a little bit of her bio and then and open the floor to her. Lisa Levinson directs In Defense of Animals, sustainable activism campaign, offering emotional and spiritual resources for animal activists and co-directs the Wild Animals campaign, advocating for wild animals. She founded Vegan Spirituality, exploring veganism as a spiritual practice and co-founded the Interfaith Vegan Coalition, providing resources for faith-based vegan advocacy. Lisa, if you could please do us the honor of sharing your journey with us, your journey of consciousness awakening, what led you to this, and then please share your work with us. Wow, such an honor. Thank you so much to Jackie and everyone who's part of this I'm gathering this morning. This is very exciting, and I'm been looking forward to it. <laughs> the Divine Feminine is such a wonderful topic. I love that. And um, as I was getting situated, I thought, well, I'm getting comfortable. And being comfortable is a big part of the Divine Feminine <laughs> and being in nature. And I think that is part of my journey as well. So um, I think how how it all began i i guess i would say it this journey of spirituality for me also started in in nature and connecting to um the presences there the animals and also the the earth and the water and sky <laughs> sun all of the elements as well so i was definitely on that journey exploring spirituality in tandem with uh really looking more deeply into veganism. And so I think that they really interwove as I was evolving as a person and found myself in uh, an or a, a group that I helped start called Public Eye Artists for Animals many years ago. And this was where we put together those two concepts of veganism and spirituality. And uh, a friend of mine, um, who was very interested in the two concepts. Both of us had been sharing back and forth. Well, what were your experiences in different communities that were spiritual? And she was asking me and we thought, wow, this is um, odd that there are these distinctly different um, communities. One was a vegan community that we both connected to and the other one was the spiritual community. And that um, for us had involved looking into uh, traditional spirituality, such as um, I was actually attending a lot of Jewish women's um, spirituality groups, and then also attending other groups like uh, women's circles, and uh, also groups that were open to everyone, and that were looking at how do we raise our energy here? How do we do that? We're going to all focus on our intention of bending spoons. <laughs> and then we're going to do that. And uh, I was part of groups that were actually doing these things. And then uh, afterwards, everyone would sit down to a meal that would include animals. And so that was such a disconnect for me. And um, I did talk to uh, my friends of mine who were running these gatherings and thought, wow, you know, uh, this is a, a big part of it is that the energy got raised up and then the energy dropped down for me in that awareness of that the animals were suffering. So I think that's a, a big part of how the foundation of vegan spirituality got put together was trying to um, really trying to understand why these two were separate and to, to put them together and to know that I wasn't the only one who felt that way. There were many other people and we just needed to find each other. So putting out the the house, as they say, building the house so other others can come in, that's the idea of vegan spirituality. It was really creating a forum, um, just like you of creating this wonderful forum here to invite people in so that they can share and explore and discover what does that mean for them. And so I consider vegan spirituality as a in uh, work in progress. It's something where people are discovering and I'm continually learning more and more as I evolve as a person too. So I think that's how how vegan spirituality began. And just as far as my vegan journey, I always have felt like, oh, I was I was born this way. Maybe I wasn't actually vegan, but I had that, you know, I've had friends who say, oh, I'm vegan at heart. 
and I'm like, oh, at first I thought, well, I wish they could be vegan in their practices and their deeds and thoughts, but I understand that they're vegan at heart. But I think that actually applies to how I felt as growing up, feeling vegan at heart, but not really putting all the pieces together. And I think that our culture um, does such a good job at separating all the pieces. So it's hard to make connections, even really obvious ones. Um, something I think back on and is having as a child really loving uh, little the rabbit's feet actually and having they they used to sell them in in um in like machines that you could buy them just like a you could buy a snack and so I remember just oh just loving these and then at one point later I realized oh my gosh these are actually the feet of animals I was so just um distraught by that and realized wow this is such suffering and I think that that's that's what I'm talking about with that level of disconnects we might not even realize that eating chicken is a chicken or eating duck is a duck or this rabbit's foot is actually a rabbit's foot you know I think it was just unbelievable that that could be possible to me um, and then beginning to put all those pieces together I think those places, the little small places that we don't think of are where that um, vegan spirit begins to grow and then become such an important part of who we are as we advocate for animals. Could you explain to us how, when you make that connection, and, and I remember for myself when I made that connection, there was this, um, this cascade of guilt that 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 I had to work through and and resolve within myself because the dissonance that was kind of simmering under the surface while I was while I was exploring my spirituality it kind of that awareness when when I discovered veganism really created that dissonance just rose to a boil and it took me a while to work through that guilt could you help us um, understand that process for you and then how you help activists deal with that Sure. Yeah, that is a very common um, concern that I hear from activists. I run a support line as part of my, my job with In Defense of Animals. I work on the sustainable activism campaign and we do provide uh, help and resources. The support line, people call us and um, anyone can reach out for support and often they'll say, wow, I'm just going vegan or I went vegan recently and I feel the weight of the world and also the personal guilt from having eaten animals for all these years until I made that that choice and so it's important to look at the moment and what we're doing now and um, then to have forgiveness for ourselves I mean self-forgiveness is a big part of being um, a sustainable activist because things happen that either out of our control or out of our awareness and so we have to develop that um, soothing part of ourselves where we can be kind and it does involve the divine feminine it does involve how do we care for that vulnerable part of ourselves that little bird perhaps that we find in our hearts that we want to um to take care of and so i think that moment that i described with the rabbit's feet actually was a memory that i had that just popped up one day when I was well into my veganism and realized, oh my gosh, I can't believe that as a child, I actually wore these as ornaments and I was just so shocked and disgusted. And then I had to go back and almost um, practice kindness towards that little person who really didn't know what, what they were in reality, especially since I have to add, at this time, I was running a like a micro bunny sanctuary in my apartment in Philadelphia. I actually had five rescued bunnies, three from a meat slaughterhouse, two from one from a school, another one who was just left on the street. And these were, um, you know, I was working on getting them adopted and giving them medications if they needed it. And so I was in the thick of bunny land and adoring them with all my heart and soul, um, in addition to the 10 cats that I had. So it was really like, it was very challenging to realize that I had done something like that. And I think that's the feeling that most people have when they think, oh, I ate all these animals and 
for me, it came about no, recognizing that here I was um, caring for these um, beautiful, soulful creatures, and at the same time, remembering that I had um, participated in uh, their um, suffering. So that awareness, I think, coupled with kindness towards ourselves can really help. And just recognizing that just like we recognize someone else who is a pre-vegan, <laughs> um, we nowadays we're approaching people who are pre-vegans with kindness and compassion and recognizing I was in their shoes at one point. Um, this is the same process we can also use with ourselves. I was in that place before I actually um, participated in this suffering and cruelty and now my awareness has shifted and changed and I am a new person. We are continually evolving, evolving and even on a biological level our cells are changing. I mean maybe the DNA is the same but the, the overall cellular structure does go through a change in our body so that we are in fact you know new new people and I think that evolution is part of our spiritual journey coming closer and closer to who we really are and that's the beauty of it is it involves this process of self-forgiveness and kindness and compassion yeah. I will say one other thing, um, a practice I like to do is to um, to offer prayer to any animals that were suffering, whether it's in the past or the present or the, the future, just to take a moment and apologize and to um, offer love and um, to t take that moment to do that, that really helps me to move on and I combine that with some self-forgiveness. So it is also involving the animals who suffered so that I can um, make amends in a way that, that feels right to me. You know, I was thinking about, as you were speaking, I was thinking about like the pre-vegans that especially in this time where there's so much um, unrest and there's so much suffering going on all around. Um, how can we deliver the message now compassionately, like you were saying, to those of us that are still pre-vegan and haven't made that connection or that awareness because of so many distraction, it hasn't been brought up to, to the front for them. How can we in this moment share the knowledge, the wisdom, the awareness, the connection to pre-vegans in a loving, compassionate way without, without our, our intention is not to create guilt and dissonance, but to bring loving awareness because we love you so much. We want you to be your best. We want to create an environment for you to raise your consciousness and be your best. How, do you, how would you help us facilitate that conversation? What awareness would you, would you suggest that we bring to pre-vegans in this moment? Well, some of it is actually just living your life and being yourself. I found that a lot of the, the best advocacy I've done is when people ask me questions about what I'm eating or what I'm doing, <laughs> why I'm doing that. <laughs> um, for example, if I, um, I used to, uh, many moons ago, I was a mosaic artist and worked in lots of different communities and I was working in the South and I remember having um, my food during the lunch and the children, these children, they were actually high school students would come up and they were saying, hey, Miss Lisa, why, you know, why, why are you, what are you eating in there? <laughs> and they might ask, oh, your, your greens look different than our greens and what's, what's going on in there? And I would just kind of explain what was happening and they're like, okay, that's cool, that's interesting. And just to share with them a little bit about why I was doing those things or often people will uh, if I have stopped on the side of the road this is coming up to more current times um, I've had a lot of people say oh is are you okay um, what's going on and then I'll say oh this bobcat died on the side of the road and I'm here I'm doing a little Reiki and just trying to um, help this animal pass uh, or if they've already passed to to give some of that universal uh, positive loving energy to them as a form of healing their trauma that they experienced. And often people will, will come up and they'll want to hear more and then the conversation extends and sometimes we get into a vegan conversation and 
and um, compassion has many faces. So the the way that you and doors in. <laughs> so it may be just being yourself, I think, is a really uh, great advocacy tool. <clears throat> I know a dear friend of mine, Ray Sakura, she always wears a vegan t-shirt and that helps her wherever she is, whether she's on an airplane, it always start, starts the conversation. People ask her questions and that's a good way. And also um, Dr. Will Tuttle, he has this lovely way of um, relating things personally, like, oh, this is what helps me. And so I've also adopted that when um, I'm in a situation with someone who is curious or may not, may not understand. And I also like the concept of a vegan allies, which uh, is something that um, Dr. Melanie Joy put forth in her, one of her books, Beyond Beliefs. And that's one I, that's helped me with my family because my family is not vegan. And um, so I've involved them in my life as allies and, <laughs> and then in opportunities where I can mention something I do. Um, and so those are some of my advocacy avenues and tools. I would love to learn more about how you started in defense of animals. What was the catalyst for in defense of animals? And please help us, you know, explain to us what in defense of animals is. Oh, of course. So in defense of animals is an international nonprofit organization that um, helps to protect animals around the world. It was started by Dr. Elliot Katz about 30 years ago and was recently uh, we have a new a president and she, this is Dr. Marilyn Kraplick and she is a practicing psychiatrist. And since she's come on board, uh, we have also included some of these wonderful programs for animal activists to help support them because she recognized that activists were suffering from compassion fatigue. And so I came on board to assist with, with those sorts of programs. I also help with the wild animals campaign. And these are some more traditional programs that Dr. Katz started many years ago. And they're still ongoing at IDA. We're a pretty broad-based animal rights organization. So we have a farmed animals campaign. We have a campaign to help iconic animals such as you know, whales and dolphins and elephants to bring them out of captivity and into the wild where they belong. And so we mostly do a lot of advocacy work. We're helping um, our, our Justice for Animals campaign and it, it helps to improve the lives of animals in the deep south, mostly domestic animals. And we also have a wild animals campaign that helps uh, wild horses and burrows that helps to, um, there's lots of things going on that the most of the public does not know about. Uh, they think of wild horses as running freely across uh, our beautiful lands, but many of them are being rounded up and um, held in pens or, or actually slaughtered. And so our, a lot of our programs are exposing these things and trying to make headway um, to create a better world for animals. And so part of what I've been doing there with the Wild Animals Campaign is we started a national Goose Protection Coalition. And so we're trying to help activists give them tools and also humane uh, strategies to help these animals before they get rounded up and killed. So again, a lot of things going on that may be happening outside of the public eye, but that are very key to improving the lives of animals and of people everywhere. Because when this is going on behind the scenes, it is like that, um, this incongruence that we have beneath the surface. And so part of being a spiritual vegan is putting all those things together in alignment and helping people realize that when animals are suffering, when anyone is suffering actually, um, that causes this disruption in the, the universal harmony that we experience. And so it is part of our, part of our dharma, our path on this planet is to, to um, help right these wrongs and whatever you feel called to do. And some of us feel drawn to help animals, others to help people, but all of it goes into this wonderful universal place of love that we're trying to um, raise the uh, spiritual awareness of our planet. And that beautifully leads me to now the Interfaith Vegan Coalition. And I would love to hear and, and please help everyone understand the 
the origins of the Interfaith Vegan Coalition and the members and what is, what is our mission as Interfaith Vegan Coalition members? Oh, yes. Yeah. So this is a very exciting project. And actually, it, it started with a conversation on the telephone with a supporter from In Defense of Animals who um, called and he said, oh, it's so frustrating that the world's religions are not um, getting it, that, that there's a connection between animal how we treat animals and how we treat ourselves and also discussing the importance of the golden rule as one um, vehicle for that. And so we had this long conversation and then I also was remembering the wonderful quote by um, the animal rights philosopher Tom Regan who said that um, here we are, we're trying to wake the sleeping giant of religion and that putting those two together it seemed like a call to action to me it's time to round everyone up in terms of our spiritual beliefs from different organizations and to work together i know that this had been done there were some wonderful efforts out there i think serve was one of the earlier groups that brought people together to do faith-based vegan advocacy and there are other faith-based um, animal advocacy groups out there that are doing wonderful work. Um, HSUS has a great group out there and so do some uh, religious associations and ministries. Uh, but Judy Carmen and I who've been working together on, on our vegan spirituality and doing our gatherings, uh, we realized that there wasn't a, a vegan coalition so to speak. Although there is a vegan alliance. I did some research and found there was one in England of groups that were coming together uh, to, uh, to align around their veganism. And we work closely with all of these different groups and we're building our community. And the reason is because we want to help people who are the perhaps lone vegan in their place of worship to try to raise the awareness in their individual community. And we're providing different tools for them, such as our vegan advocacy kits. Uh, we work also, one of our core groups is uh, Dharma Voices for Animals and Bob Isaacson who runs that group now is a friend of mine. And we had talked about what great resources they have for the community. And he said, well, you're welcome to use these for the coalition to try to enhance uh, vegan advocacy in in small ways. They have a program called Eyes and Ears where people um, connect with individual uh, uh, Buddhist groups and temp temples and ask them, oh, what sort of cleaning products do you use? Is there a way that we could use cruelty-free products and we'll pay the difference for those? And so they have a lot of really innovative programs and they've been interacting in this way with the Buddhist community. And so we wanted to um, offer the similar type of programs for all faiths. And they have a wonderful guide for Buddhists about how to um, practice veganism or vegetarianism within their communities and so we decided to put together a guide for each different religion that we that um, people volunteered to share so we've actually been so fortunate to have volunteers from all over in all these different communities who have um, shared their knowledge and wisdom to create an individualized I guess it's a guide really for people in that tradition who may want to approach their religious leaders and say, hey, can we do a, a vegan ice cream social instead of the regular one? That's what our, our church is doing. So let's try that. Or maybe it's a program in a synagogue and we want to include, um, have vegan advocacy as part of it. Even something like having a break the fast after the High Holy Holidays that includes some vegan food. I mean, that that is, just um, an, an one of our coalition members is Jewish Veg, and they have a great program. Um, it is the the name of it. I think it's like a vegan at every meal or vegan at every event. It's some they have a better name for it, <laughs> but it's it's a beautiful program that encourages veganism for every one of the events, and that it, that is 
produced by the synagogue. And so we're really, um, actually as a coalition, we're joining together and sharing resources within each of these different communities and all sorts of community, communities as well. We have a pagan vegan groups. We have groups that are um, uh, like, I think there's on, we have kits that are created. So I would encourage you to go to our website, which is interfaithvegancoalition.org. And you'll, you have access to the different kits there. Um, but we, we also have more coming and we invite people who may be vegan from one of the traditions that's not currently represented. And we will gladly um, receive uh, one of these advocacy kits from you. We have a template that we can send you so that you can help to to complete it and fill it out. And then we'll have um, assistance from the IDA graphics team to make it look so beautiful and then we can share it with other communities. So that's one of the tools that we have. But we have a lot of a lot of efforts that we're doing. We're very excited right now. We're currently working with, um, it's, a, it's a project called the SUM Ministries. It's, it's through the, um, the New Thought, the Association of Global New Thought, and they have a wonderful curriculum for all sorts of different topics from racism to uh, global warming. And they've actually invited us, our Interfaith Vegan Coalition, to submit a new curriculum for veganism. This is like hot off the press. We're just working on this and we're really excited. If anybody wants to get involved, please let us know. And this curriculum will be shared like worldwide and we're very excited. The New Thought community involves many different spiritual traditions. And so this is another way that um, through compassion and kindness, others came to our work and invited us to add to what they're offering and to help um, provide more vegan access to pe members and people around the world, actually, just to have it be a global movement. So those are a couple examples. Um, but we really gathered together to share resources, to offer resources, and to help bring faith-based vegan advocacy to the forefront of the vegan movement as well, because it is an important part. 80% of the world is very deeply committed to a religion. And if our vegan advocacy doesn't include that, we're missing out on some wonderful opportunities. So, yeah. Lisa, what do you think it is that um, our spiritual communities, why do you think the, the veganism in our message is is not is not on the same frequency as as our spiritual um, our faith based um, gatherings our leaders. What do you think is missing? Where do you feel the disconnect is in your experience? Hmm. Well, I think that that the movement the the vegan advocacy movement and the animal rights movement is in the process of shifting and changing. I think looking back at how it was. Uh, shaming others that was a big strategy with shaming others and now things are moving into how do we um, invite people to join us so those are two very different strategies and I think that it that shows a spiritual shift so from um, let's attack others and express our anger at them um, to let's invite and welcome and bring people with loving acceptance into this new way of life, which is very different from what they've known. And so as the vegan movement in general, the animal rights movement is shifting more towards vegan advocacy, more towards um, kindness and compassion. I think that that also provides more opening for spirituality. And as the movement grows in general, we are going to be reaching more people who are associated with religion. And so I think that this is a perfect time to be loving and forgiving so that we can invite and welcome and have a place for, for those people who are a Christian vegans and you know Jewish vegans and Muslim vegans and um, from different traditions so that we can, we can all join in. And actually this vegan spiritual movement really has a place within the interfaith community to bring awareness about veganism, that it's really in line with all of the spiritual values that they're, they're um, sharing with the world. And so we want to be part of that group. And then um, there's also this awareness 
that I think is growing in non-traditional communities about the earth and ecology and spiritual ecology and um, veganism fits right into that as well. So there are different um, places that, that we are naturally falling into <laughs> to uh, reach out to different communities. Beautiful. You mentioned the vegetarian and veganism. Um, and I really would love to invite you to express really the difference in that shift of vegetarianism and veganism and why that's so important. What is missing in the awareness from the vegetarians that, they, that the messages that they should be hearing and be receiving because they really do believe vegetarians that they are really doing their best that they're living homo himsa and then they they miss i mean homo himsa that we're becoming but the message of ahimsa and the golden rule and why veganism and elevating that practice to veganism why it's so important oh yes actually this is so interesting because so our interfaith vegan coalition really debuted at the uh the Parliament of the World Religions in 2018. That's where we had been doing some work, but we actually um, had a booth there and we gave out vegan food and we had all sorts of, we had our vegan advocacy kits that we had been working on, sharing them with different people who walked by. And it was a really very informative experience because we found that a lot of the vegetarians there aligned with us and they came up to say, oh, I'm vegetarian too. And, and so, and in that moment, we wanted to be very um, welcoming, of course, and and not say, oh, but we're different than you, and we think this. And, and then we thought, wow, it would be really great to have some kind of tool that we could share with people that explain things in a non-judgmental way, uh, but also a very realistic way. And so we put together a brochure. We call it the Vegetarian to Vegan Brochure. And all of these are actually on our website that you can, you can download them and take a look at them. Um, but it does... It in really addresses people from a spiritual perspective and, and says, it honors them for, wow, you have done, you've made this incredible choice to become vegetarian. And here's some reasons why you may want to look into veganism as an extension of that same decision that you made. And so I think for, for many of the conversations that we had that day, I started with a I statement and talked about what was a real eye opener for me that I was vegetarian as well for many years. And that when I learned that the veal industry was very linked to the dairy industry, that shifted my consciousness because I knew that veal was cruel and the industry involved in it and the linkages because in order to have milk, you have to create a baby. And that's something I think some people may not even fully understand uh, that these cows are need to in order for them to lactate to create the milk they have to have a, a baby every year and to so that involves um and you have the baby if the baby is a boy the boy becomes veal and i think that connection is really important for people to understand and it's a, a very basic one but one that's often hidden from our culture at large. And um, even so much that I remember when I was a child and went to a fair with my family, um, there was a very sick looking calf. And above the calf was the sign that said veal. That was a real eye opener for me because at that moment I learned, I made that connection and um, we did not eat veal any longer in my family because I would start to cry and have what you might call a fit. And that was the end of eating any, any veal. But that actually um, make, having it be very clear, the words with the animals and making that connection, I think that, that helped me. And I think for many people, they don't have that sort of experience. And so they think that um, everything is very idyllic until they learn some of the details. And there's, there is a, oh, I think the website is called Ditch Dairy or Dairy is Scary. I know at Indefensive Animals, we had a very massive billboard program to try to educate people about um, the reasons to ditch dairy. And so it 
went along with a video called Dairy is Scary, which is just a five minute video that people can watch to really understand what's going on behind the scenes. And so I think that idea that, oh, when we use or consume animal products, we're not hurting the animals. I think that is um, what happens when we're vegetarian is we believe that. And so learning more about those industries really helps us to understand that those industries are also based in cruelty and suffering. So chickens who lay eggs, they suffer greatly in those, um, those large scale factory farms where uh, they don't see the light, they're, um, the, the uric acid or the contaminants from their own um, uh, feces are everywhere. And so I think these are inhumane environments to have animals live in and they can't do their natural, their natural um, habits dust bathing, caring for their babies, all these things that we think of is pretty normal. So I think it's important for people to understand that sometimes when we see, as we're driving by, we might see, I just went on a road trip and saw lots of <laughs> cows everywhere. <laughs> and these animals, it, it appears that they're living this really wonderful idyllic life. It's only a portion of their life. Then the rest of it, they live on feedlots and um, then, of course, they go to slaughter, and it's just such a such a betrayal. Actually, I feel that um, what what happens to animals is is just the the emotional level of trauma is is huge. There's the physical, but there's also the emotional because these animals are also spiritual beings, just like us. And for them to have that sense of betrayal and knowing what their life was like, and then experiencing this uh, real um, attack. And massacre it must be so horrible on many levels. So that's the level that we can connect to the vegetarians on, and also adding in the details that may, they might, may not know of um, puts the whole per, creates a, bit, a larger perspective where they can see how this um, industry is connected. And so, in order to be in alignment with our spiritual values, we also want to. Um, take that extra step of, of exploring veganism. Wonderful. I'm going to open up to questions. Jamin has a question, but I do want to remember to, um, so we can discuss the, the, the event that's coming up. I just want to remember so we can discuss the event. So go ahead, Jamin, if anyone has any questions after Jamin. No, no, why don't you discuss the event first? There's no, no hurry on my end. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lisa, please, can you please share the event that's coming up? Yes, I will. We're very excited. We have a, a vegan spirituality forum and retreat that is coming up. It's currently planned for September, this September from the uh, 10th through the 13th, and it will be at Unity Village. Uh, and this is the, the birthplace of the Unity tradition, and it's where the Fillmores, who were really outspoken vegetarians at their time um, promoted that as part of their their uh, value system and so we're very excited to host this event at the birthplace of unity where um, these traditions came together and we want to also bring that back to it's almost like a remembering reminding reuniting with this original um, concept of being their spiritual practice aligning with the practice of vegetarianism at that time. So we're happy to host the event in this location for that reason. And there's also beautiful um, a labyrinth there where you can experience self-reflection and have moments to yourself to explore and evolve and reflect. And the other piece of this event is to connect with community. So we're going to be having these wonderful workshops where people share their vegan advocacy tools within their faith-based tradition. And then we get to swap and cross-pollinate and share ideas. And we're bringing in people to initiate the conversation, um, such as um, Sarah from Jewish Veg, who has been running these really innovative programs. We want to put her in touch with people who um, maybe it's at a synagogue or perhaps it's at a church, but they can share these wonderful ideas and tools and then bring it back into their communities. So this will be a real jumpstart for many people who are vegan or veg curious 
within their spiritual communities who want to bring some of these values back to their place of worship. And so the goal of it is to have a retreat that really focuses on faith-based vegan advocacy and giving us tools and having inspiring speakers where we have um, Dr. Milton Mills and uh, Dr. Will Tuttle, and Victoria Moran and Dr. Lisa Kemmerer who will be our featured speakers. Um, they all have a really a stronghold in faith-based traditions. And then we're going to have workshops with different facilitators who are actively doing this within their organizations. And then time to experience these, um, really experience what we're talking about in practice through community rituals and, and uh, services, like a traditional Sunday service, but how would that be done in a vegan way? So we have lots of fun things that we're sharing and we are excited to offer this type of um, faith-based vegan advocacy event where we can all connect. Now, of course, we are in the midst of um, some very major health concerns worldwide. And so there's a possibility that our retreat may be um, postponed until the next year. And we will know that within the next uh, coming weeks. And this will eventually, it will happen for sure. So we want everybody to join us. And if you do decide to join now and um, pay for the registration or whatever, all of that is just going to be um, moved over to when it is actually, uh, when it takes place. So we encourage you to join us. And you can find that, that information on our Interfaith Vegan Coalition website, or we're partnering with the Spiritual Forum to put this together. And so their website also has our retreat information. Okay, I do have other questions, but I really am going to rest now and allow anyone else to have any questions. So, Jamin? Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you, Jackie, and thank you so much, Lisa. So wonderful to have you here, and I hope you'll keep coming back. Please consider this your home. Mi casa, tu casa. Just come, just come and hang out just as a, as a guest, right? You don't have to be, you know, the main presenter every time, but, you know, also I'd love to have you present over and over because your message is so powerful. So this is a question slash comment. Um, so we've been on the previous segment to this is called Food Healers, which you're also welcome to join. Um, we do four hours of Food Healers every block party, two and two. So the last segment led by Dr. Silas Rao is here with us. Um, uh, we, you know, so we've been exploring different ways. How do we feed basically the masses, right? And um, of course, plant-based, but, um, and, and just a little tidbit, one, one solution that we've been cooking up this morning is literally just having these bulk food trucks with just massive amounts of just imagine the best vegan stew imaginable, best from a nutrition standpoint, best from a taste standpoint, best from you name it, okay. And we just deliver it for free. We go block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood, literally dispensing it. Bring your own container, no more single use. We fill it up, ultra efficient. I mean, insanely efficient, cost-wise from any measure. And so the idea, the strategy is feed everyone vegan food. And we even came up with a little riddle that kind of makes the point. How do you make the world go vegan? Answer, feed them vegan food. <laughs> I mean, how do I get my dog to go vegan? You know, do I take him to some dog psychiatrist? You know, do I show him, you know, Dominion? You know, no, no, I just, just feed him vegan food. All right, I mean, it's just like, huh? Anyway, so, but it's a way to, you know, to, I don't want to say kill two birds with one stone, but solve two problems with one solution, right? Yeah, oh, definitely. That is a wonderful idea. And I know uh, Silas shared the, uh, the, K Mama program, I think it's a new app coming out that we're so excited about supporting through our Interfaith Vegan Coalition um, to encourage uh, communities to help feed, faith-based communities to feed people who, who need food and to feed them vegan food. So we're definitely supportive and excited about that. Um, I also know there's, there's various programs that have been out there in spiritual communities, there's the soup kitchen idea. This is a beautiful elaboration on that, a vegan one, which is uh, definitely including compassion for all. And I love that idea. And then Dawn Moncrief, who uh, runs A Well-Fed World, she is also bringing vegan food to the masses through those programs. And then Keith, 
think it's McHenry, his last name, but he runs a Food Not Bombs, which is kind of the the first program that I heard about that was offering free food to people. And so this is great. It's so in line with service. And I know that at the um, Parliament of World Religions, many of us were fed every day by the Sikh community there who provided these amazing meals to thousands of people every day. And they were, um, I would say, vegan with a couple things that may not have been on the side, such as a dessert or something that you was optional. So I, I love this idea. This is a great idea. And it really is works on that massive or global scale, but also in a very local scale. For example, one great way is the vegan potluck to share what is the vegan, what, how do you, how do you do this and what kinds of foods do you eat and encouraging people to join in. I know in um, California where I am right now, we have a annual vegan Thanksgiving potluck. We invite everyone to tell their family and friends, you don't have to be vegan to join in. And um, there's a, usually about three or 400 people who show up to eat vegan food for Thanksgiving. And so that's an, a nice um, way to share. And in our in our spiritual community, our, we are vegan spirituality groups around the country. We meet every month and we were meeting in person. Now we're doing it online, uh, but our in-person groups include a potluck. And so that's another way just locally, a uh, person to person to share uh, vegan food with one another. And um, you can invite people to join in and experience what that's like. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa really wonderful to hear everything you've shared. And um, I just have a question about First Nations people. So on the coast where we live, um, there's salmon and halibut fishermen and fisherwomen. And I'm just wondering, you know, um, have you approached tribal peoples? Um, these are really old traditions and they have a lot of mythology and story around, for example, the salmon people, they call them, where they take the bones back down to the water to thank the ancestors. Um, they also, I've heard stories where they'll send down a line to the underwater people and they'll ask for one of them to sacrifice themselves for a human to be able to consume their body. Um, so there is this thing of prayer and reverence and fasting before you go out hunting or fishing. And um, because First Nations have suffered genocide for so many hundreds of years now, and they've had all their rights taken from them, their languages, their cultural traditions, et cetera. I'm just wondering how, how do you view veganism in relationship to the tribes and the First, First Nations? Yes, thank you for asking that question. So we, as part of our Interfaith Vegan Coalition, we have a, an exhibit that actually was curated by Dr. Lisa Kimmerer originally for the Animal Museum. Um, and this exhibit has, it's traveling. So if somebody would like it to come to their place of worship or community center or other location, please let us know. Uh, but it does include a panel for each, each tradition and it includes one for native traditions as well. And on the panel, it has information about um, like stories and um, and also it has uh, advocates on there that were advocating veganism as well and it, so it does show how the native traditions can also um, embrace veganism so that's one resource that we have um, and we also have a great advocate Linda Fisher who is a vegan Native American who we actually interviewed for our, our vegan spirituality online gathering. And she was sharing that um, she felt, and so I would really be answering for her. And in our conversation, she mentioned that, um, that compassion for animals was a big part of who she was and that she felt that many of the peoples in her ancestry may not have eaten animals if that wasn't the, um, what, the only option that they had. And so, that was her thought about it, was that that was the only option available to them um, for survival. And so they did that and they created a lot of spirituality around it to um, add 
and to kind of bring it to another level where there's a lot of uh, kindness involved in the spiritual um, uh, honoring of the animals. So that's that's one way to to look at it, and then there's other other ways to look at it too. Um, I was traveling in Alaska last summer, and we were traveling in areas where um, there was indigenous hunting allowed, and um, it, I found it interesting that the these areas were also um, the peoples were using pretty modern hunting methods in these areas, which um, was I think kind of interesting if I think being able to use the traditional methods and um, that might carry on some of those spiritual practices that they had, um, but being able to to use modern methods shifts it into a more modern hunting practice. So I think it's a really complex and nuanced topic and something that um, involves uh, a lot of understanding and listening on on all parts, um, being traveling up in the areas and seeing how um, there are also, I think there would be also a benefit to having some vegan advocacy um, for the health of the people that I met in those areas. And also there's some, um, some places where the the spiritual place, the spiritual perspective is not included, um, such as um, there was, I think one individual we met was talking about how he received like $15,000 for killing a polar bear. And uh, so these are, these are practices that are not actually reflective in the spiritual. Um, and I also wanna just look at other traditions too. So in Judaism, which is my background, there's that, that practice, although we never had, I didn't actually grow up knowing about this practice, but there's a practice of Kaporos where you take the chickens around the High Holy Holidays and you you place your sins into the chicken and then swing the chicken around uh, over the person's head and then basically slaughter the chicken. So this is something, I mean, I didn't know about growing up, even though my grandfather was a rabbi. <laughs> um, but this practice, there's another practice that you can do. And actually in the, the Torah, in the tradition, you can use something, it, you can use a, an actual thing instead of a living being. You can use coins or another symbol. So I wonder in many of these traditions, if there can't be a um, shifting of uh, from animals to um, objects maybe that might you might be able to include with some of the 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 spiritual practices now I'm not an expert on this so I have to only say this is just my uh, experiences and my travels so this is I would actually invite more conversation on this and more um, discussion because it is such a complex issue and um, I don't I don't think there's like a right answer in this this situation here um, and given the harsh environments where people are living in some places they don't have access to uh, to like even um, they don't have access to communication and not just communication but a distribution of materials for parts of the year and some parts of Canada where the the roads are not open or open only part of the year. So there are some, I think, real um, concerns for uh, this type of advocacy in certain areas that are have limited access. I just wanted to mention one other thing. So I'm very connected with the Haida people and um, am adopted into their tribe, actually. And um, one of the things that has really affected their health is eating uh, food that the colonizers brought mm -hmm. and not eating their traditional food. So they have a lot of diabetes because of the sugar, the pop, things like that. And um, it, it seems, I, just um, playing off of what you're saying, um, going off what you're saying, that um, there was a connection with the land and what was um, in, indigenous to the land, you know, what grew there, whether it's berries or fish, or if, I, if you think of the Inuit people, 
course, they used um, seals, which um, really hurts me, but I understand, you know, for survival, there's this connection. So there's not this, this separation, but a connection and a harmony, even though it looks bad to us. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there because I think it's, you know, it's an interesting conversation. And it, as you said, it's not, it's not simple. Yeah, it's very complex. Um, and yet we also have other complex relationships within the, the spiritual world, such as in India, where um, there's a lot of uh, the, the milk from the cows, and there's a lot of um, the stories involved in some of these traditions. So I think part of it is, is how we approach the different stories and can we um, can we shift into a, a vegan paradigm and include our our history as well so I think that there are ways to do this but it is a very complex and in a lot of the communities you're describing I think that um, this health uh, health angle is really important just for people to be healthy um, with their their food choices and um, so that might impact uh, some of their their practices. Um, maybe not all of them, just some. You know, some of the practices like you mentioned, like uh, some of the the new foods that they're eating and things like that. And these more indigenous communities, maybe those foods can be examined and and um, shifted to a vegan, more vegan friendly. Whereas they may also have their their traditional um, foods and practices so very complicated and i i think it's i really actually honor it and admire your entry into the community the haida community so you can um gain a really good understanding because i think that's part of what was happening with our animal rights community is we didn't have that understanding so it started as as kind of an attack or a battle against indigenous people and i think since um since those earlier days in the animal rights movement it has shifted and uh, most animal rights groups are, are completely backing off of that all the way so that we're actually not engaging any longer with indigenous issues. Perhaps now it's time to come back and re-engage in a different way. And so I think I would support that for the health and wellness of the community. And it is, it's such a, it's such an important um, conversation and I think traveling through the northern areas of Canada and Alaska last summer really brought that to to the forefront for me and I I know this is where a lot of the these rare animals live and we have very few of them left so I think um, my experience is a lot of the conservation efforts there uh, were to benefit the um, the peoples and a lot of it had to do with hunting rights and so there's there's so much um, um, conversation that would be great to have and so I, I I know that there will be the opportunity and the right people to have that conversation I think that will be very interesting I do um, think as our movement grows and spreads to all the corners of the earth we'll have people within the communities um, kind of raising these issues and I think that might be the the best way to approach it Damon, do we have any other questions before? Oh, let's see. I don't see any hands raised um, other than Lindy, but I think that's a photograph. Just kidding. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so yeah, feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions. Uh, Jackie, I forgot to make you co-host, so I'm going to do that. Hopefully, you'll be able to see the hands as well. Um, but right now, nobody's in the queue. Um, uh, BJ asks, what, what tribe name again? I don't know if you're asking Melissa or Lisa. We talked about Lummy and Haida. Haida, mm -hmm. H-A-I-D-A. They're from uh, Queen Charlotte Islands and um, Alaska. Um, and Haida means people. Yeah, and from my perspective, I would have to go back and look at my notes. I took notes when I was on my trip, but I don't remember all the different names, but it was the Inuit. We went up to the... Um, uh, they are called the Eskimo Lakes, but they're, it's just all the way out to the, um, 
tuk to yuk tuk, I think they call it, <laughs> tuk to yuk tuk, which is where uh, it's in Canada up in the Yukon or beyond that Northern Territory. So, yeah. so BJ has a comment. Yes. Uh, hi, Lisa. It's good to see you. Nice to see you too. Um, when people first become vegan and they first see the horrors that go on, and, and maybe also afterwards off and on, but I think more especially at the first, and you, you're talking people through how to, you know, how to manage that. One of the things that helped me was something called Ho'opono Opono. Have you heard of that? Yes, Ho'oponopono is a Hawaiian ceremony of forgiveness. And we actually did a Ho'oponopono ceremony at the, um, it was part of the SoCal Veg Fest. We were, as part of our memorial for the animals that died in the wildfires here a couple years ago, we did a Ho'oponopono ceremony. So yes, it's a beautiful Hawaiian tradition of self-forgiveness and also to forgive others. Yes. Yeah. It's helped me a lot with the with the animals that I participated in. So. Good. Well, that's good to know. It's it's so beautiful now that we have access to traditions from all over the world, such as the Ho'oponopono and the traditions of the Haida people, um, so that we can share in these um, spiritual practices that help us to be kind to ourselves. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. BJ, would you mind typing that in to uh, the chat okay. so we can share it with everyone? And I know that I've used it personally and it's trans it really was a, a vital, beautiful tool that helped me to transform my self-forgiveness and that reflection that, that looking in the mirror, it really did make it a lot easier for me in that transition. Um, and I, you can Google it on YouTube and there's, there's mantras and chants and, and you can use music, it's beautiful. Thanks, BJ. Um, and Danny has a question. And then Melissa, do you want right after Danny? Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Hi, I just wanted to volunteer. I don't know, you know, um, what I can do with any of your programs, um, but I, I just put an email to you um, so that you could, you know, keep me on your list of when you need volunteers for different campaigns or whatever I'm, I'm around. Thank you. Oh, fabulous. Now, is that for the um, interfaith, the faith advocacy work, or just for animals in, in general, helping with campaign? I don't really have a, um, I'm working on faith. <laughs> um, so I don't have a, com a faith community um, or a particular, particular you know, um, direction. Mm -hmm. I'm more of a generalist myself. So I guess in any outreach that you're doing and, you know, whatever your specific campaigns are in that, in that regard, I could be helpful. Sure. Thank you so much. Yep. I appreciate it. And you're Thank welcome you. to send, um, you can send me an email if you'd like, or reach out to me on Facebook. Um, my email is... I have a few different ones, but they basically, you can send for the purpose of this, this gathering, it's interfaith at idausa.org. And you can send any kind of question you have there. I will go ahead and answer that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I didn't have a question. I just wanted, going back to the Ho'oponopono uh, ceremony, um, because we have the orca whales here in the Northwest are starving because of the Chinook runs that are being, are diminishing uh, due to many reasons. Um, one of them being the Snake River dams, which are preventing the salmon from getting back to their ancestral spawning grounds. The First Nations um, in that area, so that's down by the Columbia River uh, south of us, are actually drumming on a regular basis and doing ceremony, asking the salmon for forgiveness. So I just wanted to also bring that into the conversation because we can drum and sing and pray for the water, for all the animals on the earth. I think that's really important. We start doing that um, to also create this uh, vibration or raise this energy around this to bring change. Thank you.
Yes, that is a wonderful spiritual tool, bringing the ancient into the modern. And um, it, it also gives us an opportunity to set intention together through prayer. And the prayer can take different forms. It might be through a drum or through a chant. And I think that we are communicating, just like you mentioned, you have that ability to communicate with the animals. And we are communicating with them through the spiritual means. And they know that we're we're there helping them. Um, and it's also a great example of uh, connecting the Native peoples with some uh, animal advocacy, because I know that there are various groups. I believe um, we in Defense of Animals have worked on this. I know for sure that HSUS has been doing a lot of work with the Indigenous peoples in those areas to collaborate to um, help the salmon, actually. That's so awesome. Thank you for doing that. Um, and so has her hand raised. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um, somebody told me about um, something called, have you heard of it? I, this was the first I'd heard of it. It's called um, Spirit Bandaging. Have you heard of that? Spirit, what was the second word? Spirit Bandaging. Bandaging. No, I haven't heard of that. What is it about? Uh, it's like I told this guy's story about something that, you know, I said it sort of gently, but it's something that he thought I'd had. And he went, oh, spirit bandaging. And I said, what, it's a thing? Yeah, yeah, it's a thing. Um, basically, people, there's this kind of spiritual healing practice that people do like remote bandaging. And they're bandaging people up. And this guy, who's actually a doctor and a, a, a scientist, he um, he said he wouldn't have believed in it, except that a couple of his relatives, who, who were, had a chronic pain from an illness, were both um, remote bandaged, and they um, they were healed. So um, then he told me this other story about um, there was an operating theatre with the patient on the theatre, on the um, operating table. And um, <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite amusing, really. It sounds like something of a story, but um, a surgeon, a Victorian surgeon, came in, dressed in Victorian outfit, and performed an operation on, you know, not touching, on the person on the um, operating table. And um, they were, they were cured and lived a long life. I, it sounds wacky, but anyway, I just thought I'd hmm. pass on the information. Wow, very interesting. I have not heard of that, but I know that the mind and the heart and the spirit together are very powerful. And there are many books actually about how we can heal our body through our mind and so, um, and our heart. So that that's very interesting. I have not heard of that. Yeah, it does remind me of distance Reiki, which is a practice that that you can do um, when you get learn about Reiki. There's the hands-on version where you're hovering above the the person in need of Reiki, and then there's the distance healing, which is sort of similar to what you're describing, where you send that Reiki energy to um, someone who's at a distance from you, and it does have a similar effect. Um, they may not know it's happening. They don't need to. You're just sending that Reiki energy there. And so I think that there's a lot of distance healing and healing with light and sound, these innovative techniques that um, have been not been explored as much in the current day and age. So I do think that there's many more healing modalities available to us if we explore those paths. Um, Lisa, I want to take this opportunity to discuss the Divine Feminine. Um, and I'd, I'd invite you to share your perspective of the Divine Feminine and the role of the Divine Feminine in this conversation and the interconnectedness with what we see as what's going on with the climate, with the environment, and our food choices. Yes, well, um, the Divine Feminine is the you know, the earth herself, really the 
the Mother Earth. And so uh, when we, and in a lot of ways to think about the Earth as, um, I, so I have a background in movement therapy and we thought of the, like the water, the rivers as the, the blood in our veins and the, so that we actually em, embodied the, the earth and the, um, the physical body of the earth, the mountains and the, the valleys, they're part of our physical body as well. And so if you think of that, it's like mother earth is, is, um, is a body as well. You know, it just a maybe different shape with their own um, rivers and valleys. <laughs> so here we are. The divine feminine is is really um, closely connected to ecology, I think, and the 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 web of life that exists on our planet. So the divine feminine. Um, there's there's maybe more um, scholarly versions of this that you, I know people study the divine feminine and maybe even um, uh, connect it to ancient sacred sites. I actually did my master's thesis was on sacred places and public spaces. So I did a little research into some of the sacred sites in, in different places around the world. But um, these places, they kind of, they, they hold this special energy that is, um, it's like the areas where we feel closely connected to the earth. We can do this just by going to any place in nature, perhaps taking off your shoes and putting your feet on the earth. There's a process called grounding where you connect your feet into the earth. And so those, those are ways to um, experience this uh, on, on in, in our everyday life. But there's also traveling to sacred sites where you feel, you can just feel a little bit more the primal um, energy there and um, it could be at an official sacred site or one that you discover perhaps you discover a beautiful a valley full of flowers and you feel like wow this is so um, it's such you your heart opens in that spot that's also a sacred <laughs> spot where you can experience um, the divine feminine so to me the divine feminine is about it's about fertility and growth and it's about um, it is all about the, the animals and, and the plants. Uh, it's about life, uh, the, the growth of life and the, um, the interconnections. Because see, there's the food web and there's all these different interconnections that happen. And those are also what happens with the feminine. We, as, as um, just thinking of we as that feminine aspect is about connecting and it's about nurturing. And um, we see this with the animals, um, especially because they're so like us, even in all their different shapes and sizes, whether they're an, an insect or <clears throat> could be a deer or it could be um, a mountain lion. <laughs> so <clears throat> I think that this divine feminine is all around us in the energy of the earth, uh, this life force that's there. And so our advocacy is to um, honor her and protect her and uh, defend her rights. I, I made I had this awareness at some point that like every patch of open land, there are many people who have advocated for this and fought for this land. It's pretty interesting. Every single little open space that you come across, someone has, has fought for that land to be open and available. Um, and I learned that even when I was living in Philadelphia, I found this beautiful little corner that I thought, wow, this area, it's amazing. It's such a beautiful natural space in the middle of this, this city. And then I met the woman and a group of people who spent their 20 years or more advocating for that little patch of land there. And I thought, yes, you know, that's part of the divine feminine is having that, that, that power to, to fight for what we believe in. And it might be a patch of land. Um, and on that land is all, are all the animals and the plants. And, and to me that, is um, 
we can embrace that within our bodies, as I was mentioning, our own um, blood and our own muscles. And, and then also there's the extension of that, which is all the animals and the plants that are around us. So, I, and that's also a way for us to see us as one, you know, when we see what's reflected within us and also see it kind of outside us as well. Um, I think that goes back to that concept of oneness. That's part of the divine feminine for me. Um, and that doesn't mean uh, only one, um, you know, God per se, because there are many traditions and some of them have many, many gods and goddesses. And this is more an aspect of connectedness, interconnectedness. Yeah. And I'm not sure that I answered all of the questions that were part of that. So if I miss any, please let me know and I'll elaborate. Um, well, it was just, just perhaps do you, uh, we could take a five minute break if you need to, to, to take a break, a body break for five minutes before we continue, Lisa. We wanna give you the opportunity because for, for visitors, it is easy for us to just hit you know, the screen oh. and just take a quick body break if you need it. Um, oh, oh, that's very sweet. Um, I think I'm okay. I think I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, what what I wanted to to ask you was, um, and I don't know if it's the same question. So, so maybe you could help me. Um, how, when we make these food choices spiritually, what happens to us? If you can explain to us spiritually, when we make this this conscious and aware um, decision, how that affects us as spiritual beings. And then how that then ripples into the ethers, into the collective consciousness, and how that affects now our Mother Earth and what's going on with the climate on a spiritual level. Mm, yes, that's a beautiful question. In fact, um, when I started vegan spirituality and was trying to get it out there in the world, uh, I had a lot of people come up to me and said, oh, yeah, when I went vegan, I became spiritual. I was not spiritual at all. And actually, I had a couple. I remember they came up to me at, at a, a vegan boot camp workshop that was going on <clears throat> through a Vegan Mainstream, which is run by Stephanie Red Cross. And, and during this workshop, <clears throat> people came up to me and they said, oh, yeah, we were not at all spiritual. And suddenly, this has come upon us because we've become, we've been vegan. So I think actually um, the diet or lifestyle itself promotes um, our opening of our consciousness. And this goes back into the spiritual tradition. So even in the, the Vedic, um, the, the diets there, are the, the, the sattvic and the rajastic, rajastic diets, uh, and the sattvic was the more vegetarian, um, vegan-friendly <clears throat> diet that opened your consciousness and awareness. And many of the, the monks uh, who even in, I think, Korean Buddhism, there's certain types of Buddhism where the, the monks themselves do not eat animals and um, mo most likely animal products as well because that's in these traditions, they, they, that went together. So their um, deep meditations um, involved this, this diet that was not including any animal products. And so I think that helped them to, to access the deeper meditation points within themselves and to go to more places. And that's part of vegan spirituality. It really is. Like when we make a choice to, to actually remove violence from our um, diet, from our remove it from our plates. That's one way that we can um, cl more closely connect with our own inner peace, but also help to promote peace on the planet, world peace. So they're really connected to what we're eating. And it's a big part of who we are. If you think about that, we are what we eat, these sort of ideas, they come from a spiritual place as well. And when we're aware of what's going on in the suffering and we choose not to consume suffering, that um, creates an inner harmony uh, because we don't have that cognitive dissonance anymore. And even we don't have uh, that we're contributing to something where we don't, we don't know the whole picture. There is suffering in it. And on some level, um, there may be some 
awareness of it uh, on a spiritual level. So when we make that choice um, to go vegan or eat uh, a clean diet, there's different words for what people describe this as, but um, when the, the more uh, closely we come to a vegan diet and lifestyle, we will be more open spiritually. And I think this happens to spiritual people of all kinds. Um, and so th I think there's like a, it's really a relationship between veganism and spirituality in a way, because some people become vegan and then they, they suddenly have a more uh, openness to spiritual practices and they may be more about self-care, maybe more about earth-based spirituality, or it could be like that they delve deeper into um, traditional spirituality from a vegan perspective. Um, or So that's one way in. The other way in is for people who are spiritual and they're exploring that more and uh, becoming more aware of the world around them and uh, deepening their empathy for other people. And over time, it starts to um, deepen for the animals and then they make a choice to become vegan. And so I've found that this um, intersection can happen from different directions. It's a crossroads and it can come from different directions, but they're linked together, veganism and spirituality. Um, and I think we find this with fasting. People who fast often, they're not consuming animal products and many spiritual traditions, they do that. And that is a way of um, connecting to the, uh, that nonviolence and veganism. And also in some places they encourage um, fasting for for health and wellness too, um, and that's goes along with the clean body, clean mind, clean heart. Um, so there's there's lots of ways in, but there's definitely a connection between what we what we eat and our spiritual um, evolution. Go ahead, Melissa. Um, I just wanted to add this, um, which is a personal experience I had. So um, I consider myself a deep spiritual person and always probably have been very tuned in that way. But I used to eat meat. I grew up in Europe and Europeans, you know, they make a lot out of their cooking and a lot of there's a lot of meat on their plates. And I studied magnetism, which is very similar to Reiki. And it was an intense program. And uh, the teacher taught us to take our hands because everything's done through non-touch, just passing your hand, and to go to the grocery store and pass your hand over whatever section you were in to feel, you know, to get the right tomato or the right whatever. And I got to the meat section and there was something in my consciousness that knew I wasn't supposed to eat meat anymore, but I was still indoctrinated into the pattern of eating meat. And I go to the hamburger section, the mince meat, and I pass my hand over the packets and I pick one that I knew I shouldn't have picked, but I picked it anyway. And I go home and I prepare it. And that night I had the most horrific panic attacks that lasted all night, you know, it was cold sweat, I felt sick. And I had my magnetism class the next day and I said to the teacher, you know, I went to the grocery store, I did this, I picked out this, I, and this is my experience. And he said, ah, yes. He goes, you experienced the fear of the animal that was slaughtered and it transferred to you. And that was a huge awakening for me. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I think that's kind of interesting. You know, it's like when, when the student is ready, right? The teacher appears, whether it's in physical form, like a teacher or like a packet of chicken or whatever you're about to cook, where you have this direct physical experience that just changes you um, mm -hmm. from that moment on. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. That is such um, a perfect example of um, that we are, you know, what we eat in a way. And I know Dr. Will Tuttle talks about that in, in his writings about that we take on the animal's um, emotions at, at their time of death and that that becomes part of the fiber of our being and um, on a spiritual level. And you experience that. That's very profound, really profound. And I I wonder if people in your class, what they thought of that, the people who were 
there. That's so interesting. That would make a big connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, just a little tiny thing uh, on top of this is the other thing um, is if we're not consuming fear and violence, then the natural world around us doesn't have to fear us any longer. And so, you know, that makes me think that this connection that we can have directly with animals coming to us, wildlife, without fear, because they have nothing to fear. They know you're not going to hurt them. Mm -hmm. And um, there is something, I think it was Wayne Dyer who said, I don't know if it's something he wrote himself or he's quoting someone. He said, when you cease to have thoughts of harm directed towards yourself or any other creature, all of life will cease to have fear of you. And mm. uh, I just, that's my direct experience as well. And so stop having violence, whether it's actual physical or through cons consuming the meat or through our thoughts and our emotions, then we can live in harmony with mother earth and all of life. Mm. Beautiful. I love that. Wayne Dyer is so fantastic. <laughs> such a great leader in many, many ways. He offered so much wisdom in, in such a um, pleasant, jovial way, actually. So, yes, these are, these are really important aspects of spirituality and how it connects to veganism. And I think that's what's so interesting about all this is everybody's individual journeys and their stories what they share and, and how they experience it because we all learn from one another and that helps us to also um, give permission to to feel and sense in new ways and maybe even to reflect back on our past and say oh gosh I did have this sort of experience I didn't recognize it as such until I heard this story by another person so I think that building vegan community is really key um, to supporting each other but also to to creating a movement um, that is uh, based on on love and um, compassion and unity in a lot of ways for all of us. So it's really, it's a pleasure to hear everybody's stories and where they're coming from and the kinds of experiences that they had. Um, and I think that helps to validate our own experiences and open us to new ones. Yeah. I'd love to, to read uh, Vince. Um, he made a, a comment here and I was, I was just going to mention something about it. If it's okay, Vince, I don't know if you would, do you want me to read it or would you rather just make your comment? Well, you can go ahead and read it. If you got some comments or thoughts about it too, then be happy to share it. I'm curious to hear what you have to say too, Jackie. Well, I'll read what you have to say, Vince. He's, he writes, I have a thought too. If you read the Bible, the animals were afraid of humans when God gave limited and temporary provisions to eat animals. If we went back to God's original eating of eating plants, I think the animals would indeed quit fearing us. According to the prophet Isaiah, we will live at peace with the animals again and nobody will harm or destroy. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that contribution, Vince. And what, what I was going to contribute was again, first of all, thank you for this platform because it is this platform that believes that it is in conversation. It is in conversation and sharing and trust and unity that we will cultivate an environment that will bring forth the healing and, and the honor that our mother uh, deserves from us. And I feel um, in the divine feminine, I feel that uh, what resonated with me was not only Will Tuttle's teachings of the divine feminine, but when Victoria Moran shares her story of the betrayal of how the cow felt so betrayed and was fearing for its life. And that in order for her to continue on to slaughter, it took her owner, it took her, the farmer to give that whistle, a whistle that she, that resonated with her, a whistle that made her feel safe. And so she turned her away from her instincts. She betrayed her own instincts and she went into slaughter. And that really, in, in, in this body as, as a female, that resonated with me so much that we share not only our individual stories, but those of us that understand and can speak the language of the animals to share their experiences. The betrayal that I felt within me was so deep that I looked at myself not only as a woman and as a being, but as a mother. And it changed 
everything of how I saw animal agriculture. And, and I often tell people that what's going on with our mother and what's going on with humanity, it's our opportunity to raise ourselves and be deserving of the love that she just freely overflows to us. And that we've put her in such a compromising position that because we have forgotten who we are, we are, have turned against our brothers and sisters to, to raise ourselves up in form. And we've betrayed our own spirit, our, our own relationship with her and one another. And we deny the intelligence, the innate intelligence of animals, their ability to communicate. And I feel like when I went vegan and I cleared the toxins and the fear and the betrayal and the suffering and the cruelty from, from my blood, that my cells were now swimming in love and light and vitality, that I could reconnect with that intelligence that I had suppressed within myself. And I could hear the intelligence all around me and I felt connected again. And I think that is what's going to bring healing with the planet because we, once again, we can speak to our mother. Once again, we can speak the language of love, not only physically, but energetically within one another and interconnected with our brothers and sisters that look like us and speak different languages. And it doesn't, I don't feel any longer like, like Silesh tells us, Homo sapiens sapien, the wise, wise ones, the oxymoron of all oxymorons, but return us to Homo ahimsa, to that message that we were born to be, that we are peace, that we are light, that we are love, and to return us to our own origins and to remind us of who we truly are, because I think we have forgotten. And to me, it's the great awakening is the great remembering that we are all the same, and that we all look at each other and remember who we really are as daughters and sons of our mother, but also as stewards. Our consciousness, we have this ability to have consciousness that is separate and above the other animals. But like Salah says, we are older brothers and sisters. We are older brothers and sisters. We are not here. We don't have dominion over them. We have the moral obligation to care for them and honor them and love them and protect them. And that betrayal to me is what we're reversing now. And through conversations where we are safe, where these are delicate conversations, but it's a trusting sacred space that we can talk to one another and through love, which to me, the vegan spirituality did, gave me the ability, the language and the forum to share in compassion and reach this message to most people without that guilt or shaming but in that I love you so much. Can I share my story? Can I share with you what I've learned? Because I love you so much, I want you to be your best as well. Wow, Jackie, that is just so perfectly said. That is amazing. I, I appreciate your eloquence and your heartfelt message. And yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, it's so beautiful. I actually, um, think that there's that that animals just just like you know just like people are very curious and they they want to see what's new in their environment and that they will um, naturally um, explore and find find if we're if we are there in love and without any thoughts of harm um, they will come and venture out and we will uh, reunite with them as friends actually and I think it's so amazing to experience this on many levels and even just um, was camping recently and there was all these little teeny weeny baby fish <laughs> in the water and and just like when I see them I'm just feeling so much love and excitement and um, I don't have any any thoughts about harm or anything in there and so they come up and I get to be friends with them and I think I think part of it is 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 just that simple um, having that that curiosity to meet each other even though we appear different we're we're same on so many levels and um, I think on a spiritual level we're the same so it's fun to to make new friends in, in different bodies. <laughs> and I think that would happen naturally if if we weren't as a culture consuming animals and oppressing them and um, keeping them in in um, almost like um, jails, <laughs> then then we would have 
free movement of animals and, and people and, and we can live in harmony. I do, I do truly believe that that's possible. And on a biological level, um, even in conservation movements, that idea of coexisting with animals, um, even animals like mountain lions. I think there was a time where people were very afraid of nature and the animals and they didn't want to get attacked. And I think that now we're trying to move past that and even in, in biology is trying to also move past that, the structures and how uh, like at some of the national parks, they used to kill the predators, animals, and now they don't do that anymore. I mean, some of them don't do that. And that that's like a progressive thinking. So I think that some of the, the merging in a way of spirituality and science, although they don't often see eye to eye, uh, that they're developing a, a deep respect for nature. And we find this in a lot of like eco-spirituality and those sort of um, those sort of disciplines that are right on the cusp. So that's, that's what will happen if we um, align our, our spirits with our, th our thoughts and our actions and um, invite these uh, conversations with each other, some of the complicated ones, but also with the animals. And it may be through words or just through, um, through uh, um, em empathic or, or telepathic communications or even just being present to each other and, and witnessing each other. So I think that um, I love what you shared, Jackie. I'm so excited for that, that vision to manifest even more fully. Thank you. And I really want to share um, and, and, and expand what you were just saying that behavior is communication. We don't have to communicate just with our words. Our bodies are vessels. We are communication. We are connection. So everything we do, our actions with that intention of love and compassion, with our actions, we communicate. So that is the language that, that all of Mother Nature, it is our actions and it is our intentions. That is how we, how we think of ourselves and how we go forth in the world is how we spread that love. Um, we have one other question with Dev and then I would like to offer the floor for Lisa to have any closing remarks before we end the segment. So Dev? Okay, so maybe that was a mistake. I thought Dev had um, a hand up. But um, Lisa, do you have any closing remarks before we thank you so much and uh, wish you well? In oh, well, I'm so honored to be part of this conversation. I mean, I'm happy to share. I definitely feel that um, each one of us has uh, an equal story to share about this and so to me it is a conversation with um, with our community who each have their own spiritual connections and experiences to share so it's been really a pleasure to to join in and and um, to share what I can and also um, I think it helps when we have these conversations to um, kind of define and refine our thoughts and what we're thinking and, and our values. And so to me, that's what we're doing in these conversations. This is right in the moment, we are creating vegan spirituality. We are doing that through this conversation, through sharing and listening and hearing and kind of refining what's going on up there and here. And that's, that's what it's all about. So vegan spirituality, when um, uh, Sandy Herman, my friend, coined that term, and we decided to start meeting as a group, and um, it really was an ex exploration. It really was about let's co-create something. Let's design our own new vegan rituals, because a lot of the rituals, and even some of the ones from perhaps early humans could have been around, you know, hunting and other things, we want to create some new ones. This is a new time, and, um, and we want to uh, create that harmony through these new new types of um, rituals and ceremonies that we're putting together. And that's what it's really about, is how do we create this? And at the same time, be loving and forgiving and um, to uh, the existing traditions that are out there and uh, see this vegan spirituality more as a, a common ground where we can come together and unite and 
the Interfaith Vegan Coalition is, is a way to help uh, share some of these values with other existing traditions and um, support one another in our efforts to um, promote kindness and compassion for everyone on the planet. And so I encourage anyone who wants to join in to our Interfaith Vegan Coalition, there's no um, member dues or any kind of special um, certificate you need to join. <laughs> you can just join us. We have a meetings once a month on the second Monday. Anyone's welcome to join in. Uh, we have a Zoom meeting and um, that's kind of our, our planning. What are we doing? What are our strategies? What's going on in your heart that you want to share with our community so we can take action on it. So it's really, a, it is a, a coalition and, and a collaboration. So um, you can join in if you want. You can reach out to me through that interfaith at idausa.org email. And then I will add you to our email list. Um, we have a newsletter that goes out every month. We're just starting that. And um, I would love to, to hear from everyone. and whether you have a concern and, and you feel like you need support as an activist, I run that support line. I'm happy to chat, um, but also any ideas you have for um, helping to promote veganism in a spiritual community, that would be great too, because that's, that's what we need is to work together to, to um, build this. And so I think that's what I'll share if, 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 um, Anybody, I mentioned the, the, the geese issue as well. If you want, you can, if you have any concerns about cruelty to geese or any roundups going on or anything going on with the animals, that you can also reach out to me too. Um, I'd be happy to, to help in all those ways. So thank you so much. I just feel very full of love and joy to be part of this beautiful community and I'm excited. I will come back to join in as a guest. That's wonderful. I look forward to that. Thank you. Um, and I, I want to thank everyone for being here. I, I want to thank this space that supports our alignment, that our thoughts and our words and our actions are all in alignment. And so we can be the best versions of ourselves every day and work towards that radical inclusion and that just compassion that's going to spread healing and help our mother return to the health and vitality that she is. And Lisa, could you lead us on how we close our, our meetings? Our interfaith yes. meetings? We do, we do. Um, we have a special uh, little gesture that we do, and it was actually um, brought to us by Frank Lane, one of our coalition members, and it's just Namaste Vegan. Very simple. It's kind of a, in a way, it's like opening of the heart and the mind and finding veganism in our, and the V, which is somebody has the, the V symbol up right now, or V for the vegan flag, which is another great initiative. And then maybe we can end that with just connecting with our hearts. You know, we talked a lot about self um, forgiveness with Ho'oponopono, which is a wonderful Hawaiian ceremony that I, um, I definitely identify and love the Hawaiian culture. I do hula dancing. Some of you may not know that, but it's special kind of placing your feet on the earth and connecting with her. So I want to bring in that divine feminine through our hearts, through our, our, our vegan namaste. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you. Aww. Well, Thank you for having me and for sharing. I, I think we just learned so much from each other and that's why it's important to gather. So these spaces, this is where it's at. This is where it's happening. It, just these spaces that we're creating. Oh, and um, right now, one of the benefits of the COVID is a silver lining, I guess you could say, might be that we're doing a lot more connecting online and creating more forums. And this is uh, where this is where change is happening. The revolution it, it begins here, and I know there's a powerful quote: "The revolution is will be televised." And in a way, here we are at our our sort of computer televisions, um, being able to create that re revolution. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I think Dr. Silas Rao would call it a silicon lining, but silver lining works too. <laughs> and um, yes. 
And I really want to encourage everyone, we're going to just take a quick, maybe three, four minute musical break, and then um, we'll be on to our next segment, which really dovetails, dovetails beautifully with both this one and the previous Food Healers segment. It is a segment, a two hour segment on a world beyond money. And it's led by our very own R. Brettminster Full of It. <laughs> our Brett Minster full of it and uh, he's here now uh, joining us from England uh, but like I promised if we're just gonna take a musical few minute break maybe three four or five minutes and if that works for everybody if, if anyone needs more time just let us know and uh, we'll pause recording for the moment or stop recording rather and 